be seated and uh, grab a copy of God's Word. If you don't have one, there's a cart down the center aisle that has Bibles on it. You can uh, grab one of those and uh, turn with me to our Old Testament reading this morning, which is Exodus chapter 20, which we will be, uh, Lord willing, uh, returning to next Lord's Day. I'd like to read to you verses 1 through 17. These are very well-known words. Perhaps, young people, you've actually even memorized uh, Exodus 20, 1 through 17. <clears throat> Let me read it to you now, reminding you this is the word of the Lord. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not make the, take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gate. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Let's turn to uh, Romans chapter 13, and uh, hopefully you'll see the method to my madness here in this break away from Exodus, our look at Exodus, to preach some sermons from the New Testament related to the law of God, which we are about to study together from the passage in Exodus that we just read. And so I'd like to um, uh, read to you now Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, where we will uh, be meditating upon this morning. This is God's word. O no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, oh, what needy people we are as we come to your word, Father. We find nothing in ourselves that would um, give us the strength to hear your word and to respond to it as we ought. So we look outside of ourselves to you who has promised to give his spirit generously to his children that we might have wisdom from heaven that we might be able to discern the spiritual things that you have revealed in your word and that uh, by uh, that same spirit we might believe and we might do according to your good pleasure. And so we pray that you, by your spirit, would write your word on our hearts. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, uh, we're continuing, again, this brief detour away from Exodus chapter 20. Uh, We are winding our way back there, though, however, to the Ten Commandments, um, looking at several passages that must 
inform our understanding of God's moral law if we're going to rightly divide the word of truth. So uh, the approach that many take um, interpretively when they come to Scripture often sees this massive chasm between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and it's unbridgeable. They just they don't touch one another. Um, some even go so far as to say that the Old Testament is not Christian scripture, per se. Some Christians say that. Um, it's for the Jews, some might say. And, and the New Testament is scripture for the Gentile church. Some even go further and say that the Old Testament reveals a different way of relating to God through the law for the Jews. And then the New Testament reveals the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the way that the church is to relate to God. And now, I don't see how those interpretive ideas can be squared with the words of Jesus Christ and what the rest of the New Testament teaches us about the Old Testament's relationship to the New. Now just think of Jesus, John chapter 5, or Paul, Corinthians chapter 3. He, and he said that when the Jews read the Old Testament, they have blinders on. They can't see the truth. They, they thought that obeying the law, we see this in Jesus' ministry when he's, he's engaging with the Jews, that the Jews believed that the law was given to them as the way of salvation, as the way of eternal life. Keep the law. But Jesus said in places like John 5, 39, uh, Luke 24, 25 through 27, write those down, check them out. Jesus said in those pl- places, The Old Testament is all about me. Jesus says, and he taught his disciples this, that did you not know these things? You have the scriptures, that the scriptures reveal these things. The Old Testament scriptures reveal the, uh, the necessity of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, of his life and his death and his resurrection. That's what the Old Testament was about, but the Jews missed it, and so we would be foolish to imitate their error, wouldn't we? And just think of the, the burden of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel, his burden in that Gospel is to demonstrate that Jesus Christ is the true Israel of God. He came to fulfill all that was written in the Old Testament. When, where Israel had failed as the, Israel was the son of was God's son, but they were they didn't fulfill the Old Testament scriptures. And so Jesus comes as the true son of God. He's the true Israel. This is why Jesus, of course, identifies himself in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, as the true vine. He's the true vine. And Paul says in Romans chapter 11 that the only way to be attached to that vine whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, is by faith in Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 4, verse 17, Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, Paul calls Gentiles who trust in Jesus Christ, he calls them sons of Abraham and heirs according to the promise that was made to Abraham. In 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 and following, Paul tells a largely Gentile church that the Jews that God brought out of Egypt, he said, those are your forefathers. You're you're connected to them. He says that the same, the the spirit, the the things that they ate were, were the same spiritual food that the church drinks. The same thing that they drink is the same spiritual drink that the church drinks today. I would point out to you that the entire book of Hebrews was written to prove that the Old Testament earthly temple, its priesthood, and its sacrifices were temporary copies and shadows. Copies and shadows. They were always meant to give way in due time to the true heavenly temple, priesthood, and sacrifice that is seen in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 11 tells us that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that they understood by faith that the the promised land of Canaan was not the way that the Jews think of it today. 
The patriarchs saw that that little strip of land that was conquered by Joshua and David. They saw that, our, the patriarchs saw that as a temporary earthly placeholder for the true inheritance that God has planned to give his people. We're told in Hebrews chapter 11 that Abraham waited for a city whose builder and maker is God. We're, we're told in Ch- Hebrews eleven sixteen that by faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob desired a better country, that is, a heavenly one. And Paul speaks of that heavenly city in Galatians chapter 4, verse 26, where speaking to Jew and, and Gentile mixed church, Paul alludes to Psalm 87, and, and he says that the Jerusalem above is free and she is the mother of us all. The inheritance promised to Abraham and his children is actually the new heavens and the new earth that we read about in the Revelation, chapter 21. Coming down out of heaven from God, as, as John describes it to us. And he describes it there as the holy city, the, the new Jerusalem. He tells us that on its gates are written the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And on its twelve foundations are written the twelve names of the apostles of the Lamb. Now what I am laying out here is only scratches the surface of the New Testament evidence that we need to take into account if we want to understand how Jesus and his apostles interpreted the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament. What was promised in the Old Testament is fulfilled by Jesus Christ and his coming. To them, to Jesus and his apostles, the Old Testament is Christian scripture. Together, the Old and New Testaments tell one story. One story of the history of redemption in Jesus Christ. The whole story is about the seed of the woman who is coming to crush the head of the the serpent, Genesis chapter 3, 15, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole story is about him. There is one holy book with one story, one way of salvation, one Savior, one sacrifice, one holy people united in one vine and only one city of God. Now, you're probably wondering, Jeff, why are you saying this? What in the world does this have to do with Romans 13, 8 through 10? And let me tell you, it has everything to do with it. it. Contrary to what is popularly believed in the Christian church today, there is, there is also only one law that God has given to his people to, sh- to live out the life of gratitude to him for the salvation that he has delivered them to. Now, it's widely believed by Christians in our day that the law of the Ten Commandments was for the Jews, but Jesus has given the church what is called, sometimes people call it the the law of love. There's the the law of the Ten Commandments, and then there is the law of love, and those are two different things. It's believed that the law of the Ten Commandments has been fulfilled by Jesus, which it has, but consequently, since he has fulfilled it, now it's been abolished for Christians. But I've tried to show you in recent weeks that when Paul says that we are not under law but under grace, he's not saying that the law of the the Ten Commandments has no relevance to our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. When Paul says that, that we are not under law but under grace, he's saying that the law of God has taught us that by the works of the law shall no flesh be declared righteous in God's sight. So we saw this last week from Romans chapter 6. Paul says, you have been delivered to a different form of doctrine. And that form of doctrine says that we can only be saved by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. And then our Lord Jesus Christ told his disciples on the night on which he was betrayed, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. 
That is John 15. And some Christians hear that and they say, see, Jesus has freed us from the law of the Ten Commandments as, he guides, as the guide that directs us how to follow him. He has only commanded us to love each other and love our neighbor as he has loved us. But the Ten Commandments, sorry, they have no continuing relevance for the Christian life. Well, tell that to the Apostle Paul. Because he teaches us here that Jesus' commandment for us to love one another is a command for us to imitate Jesus by living to fulfill the law of the Ten Commandments. Not to save ourselves, but because Jesus has saved us already. And we see this first by considering what Paul calls in verse 8 our obligation to love. Owe no one anything except to love one another. To understand what Paul precisely is commanding here, we have to see how it relates to what he just said in verse 7, where he was uh, finishing up some comments uh, talking about um, the Christian's relationship to governing authorities, who, Paul says, bear the sword as ministers of God for good. Paul says that we are to be subject to such authorities even paying taxes to them. Verse 7, Render therefore, he says, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And you can see that Paul is talking about paying to people what you owe them according to God's ordinances. And what we owe, what we are to pay is to a person is different from, uh, it may be different to one person than it is to another, depending on uh, their respective role in society. But Paul's general point here is pay to each one what you owe him or her. That's, that's Paul's point. And if you see that here, then it, it can help you avoid a common error that people make when they come to verse 8. Right? They read um, verse 8, that says, owe no one anything except love. And they say, see, now Christians are forbidden from borrowing money. No home mortgages. No, don't take out a loan on your car. Owe no one anything except love. But Paul's not, that's not what Paul's talking here. He's talking in terms of pay what you owe. That's his point. And there are, by the way, other places in Scripture where God's law regulates how money and objects can be borrowed and how they ought to be repaid, and so it's lawful for people to borrow things. What's unlawful is not paying what you owe. And that's Paul's point here, is pay what you owe. And what we owe, what we are commanded by our Lord to pay to all, is a debt of love. Love. Now some of you basically, phrase uh, love one another there in verse 8 that the command is limited um, to believers loving one another that this is just inside of the church right and certainly it is true that our obligation to love our fellow Christians is necessitated by the fact that we are one body in Jesus Christ and Paul says in Ephesians 5 that no man ever hated his own body but he loves and cherishes it so it's not, it's not rational not to love your, the body of Christ and your Christian brothers and sisters. We are brothers and sisters in the truest sense of the word. And Christians inside the church have more in common uh, with their Christian brothers and sisters than they truly do with their blood brothers and sisters. And we are brothers and sisters. And Jesus said that it is our love for one another by which the world will know that we are truly his disciples, John 13, 35. So love is the hallmark, fruit of the Spirit, that distinguishes Christians as the children of God. Love is like a flame that lights upon the heart of a believer when they comprehend the vastness of the love by which we have been loved by God in His Son, Jesus Christ. Now back in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, Paul said, And I love this verse. Paul said that the love of God 
has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And by the the love that the Spirit of God pours into our hearts, we interpret Jesus' act of dying, uh, giving His life for our life, we interpret that as the most glorious, captivating, and compelling expression of truth that has ever been revealed. And God, it, it reveals to us that God of and God will spend all of eternity demonstrating to his children the truth that he is love and that is the unsearchably rich discovery that we have made of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ so that now the Christian life is a life of love as Paul speaks of it here It flows directly from the Holy Spirit who is the one who dazzles us with the love of Jesus Christ and He makes us Jesus' willing captives. By pouring out the love of God in our hearts, the, the Spirit holds us in that joyful grip of Christ's love. We as Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 5, that, that we live no longer for ourselves, but for Him who died for us and rose again. By His Spirit, we have been made to love Him who is love itself. And from this union that we now have with Him, who we have with Him who is love itself, we are inspired and we are empowered to become lovers of sinners too. Lovers of sinners. Especially our sin-soaked Christian brothers and sisters. But we owe a love that we must pay, not just to them. Now look at verse 10. Paul quotes Leviticus 19.18 there, and he affirms that we owe a love that we must pay to our neighbors also. The Pharisees, uh, you might remember, and Jesus, they clashed so frequently in the Gospels. Um, And one of the things that, Uh, they clashed about was Leviticus 19.18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now the Pharisees, they taught that uh, our neighbors are people who are kind to us, who are good to us. Not people like the Samaritans, for example, whom the Jews, you might remember, uh, considered to be their hated enemies. But Jesus wrecked that interpretation of Leviticus 19.18 by telling a story in which a Samaritan was the hero. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, Luke chapter 10, a man was robbed and left for dead on the side of the road, and he needed help. But Jesus describes a priest and a Levite, both of whom walked around to the other side of the road to avoid this man in need. But then there was this certain Samaritan man who saw him and and he bandaged his wounds. He got him a place to recuperate and he paid for his care. And, And the lesson of that parable was that our neighbor is anyone and everyone we have opportunity to bless. Now kids, let's ask another question. This love that we owe to our neighbor, what is it like? What is it like? This is a good question to ask, I think, because our um, American culture portrays for us a very uh, different kind of love, I think, than what we see in Scripture. Love for others in our culture is a feeling that comes and goes. Here today, gone tomorrow. Right? We are told that people can fall in love with each other, right? It's because the logic of the world's love, it, it works like this. As long as you still make me happy, I will love you. As long as you are still funny, I will love you. As long as you have money, I will still love you. As long as you are still attractive to me, I will love you. 
As long as you aren't a burden to me, I will love you. As long as you fulfill all of my wishes, I will love you. What's wrong with that definition of love? That doesn't sound like love to me at all, does it? I'll tell you what's wrong with it. It, it is actually the exact opposite of what God's word define, how God's word defines love. Just think of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The, the world's kind of love that I just described, it is, that, it, it, it is selfish and rude. It seeks its own benefit. It, it is not kind. It does not bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. The world's love is a love that fails. It's not a love like God's love at all. Now, I can prove it to you. Turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Just turn over a few chapters and look at Romans 5, 8, where we are told what God's love toward us is like. And this is the love, you guys, with which later in Romans, when we get to chapter 13, that we are being called to love our neighbor with. Paul writes, God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In verse 10, he says that while we were still enemies, that is when God demonstrated this love to us. So we have to say, first of all, that when we define the love that we owe and that we must pay to all, it is not a love for others that requires them to do what pleases us before we will love them. It's a love that extends to people who have sinned against us and even acted as if they were our enemies. It is a love that stoops down to serve sinners who do not deserve our love or our service. But that's us too. A Christian love says, I will not do to you what you have done to me. I will do to you what I would have you do to me. I will love you as I love myself. Regardless of what you do or don't do to me. And if the Holy Spirit is not convicting sin right now, it's because the Spirit isn't giving you ears to hear because each one of us stumble in many ways in this regard. We, we say we love our spouse, we love our siblings, we love our Christian brothers and sisters, we love our neighbor, but so often it is a, a, a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately kind of love. It is, it is a love that quickly turns to anger or even hatred when the other person doesn't meet our expectations or has offended us or has sinned against us. It is a love that fails to seek the good of the other because we are more concerned what of, for what is best for us. And the fact that we seldom love others with the love of God is proven by how quickly we'll turn on each other at even the slightest offense. Now consider what Jesus was willing to suffer at our hands in order to love us, or in order to demonstrate his love for us. Consider that. Are we, are we not being called to do the same for one another and also for our neighbor? That love, the, the love we owe, the, the love that we must be careful to pay to all. Paul defines it here as a love that fulfills the law. And he mentions a few of those laws, right? You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. Where do those come from, young people? It's the, 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 right, it's the, we just read it a little while ago. It's the Ten Commandments. Those are, those are commandments 6 through 10, listed there for you in order. Now, historically, uh, the, the church has referred to the last six commandments as the second table of the law. And the first table of the law are commandments 1 through 4 that tell us this is what it looks like for you to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second table of the law is, is the last six that tells us what it looks like for us to love our neighbor as ourselves. And you, you notice here that Paul, interestingly, didn't list the fifth commandment. 
Now, I think, my, I, speculatively, I think he didn't list the, the fifth commandment because uh, he was just teaching about it in verses 1 through 7. You shall honor your father and mother. One of the applications of that law, of the fifth commandment, is to render honor to whom honor is due. Not just to father and mother, but to the governing authorities. And that, that's what Paul was just talking about. And this shows us something about the Ten Commandments that we should know. As God's moral law, the Ten Commandments are a summary of, of what God would command us to do. And they're a summary in such a way that, that under one sin or one duty, all of the same kinds of sins are, forbi are forbidden and all of the same kinds of commands are included. And we'll see this when we look at the Ten Commandments. But this is why Jesus could say in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, he could say that uh, a, a man has committed adultery. He has broken the seventh commandment when he has looked upon a woman with lust in his heart. It's because not only is adultery, not, uh, is adultery prohibited, but anything that tends to adultery is prohibited too. Anything of that same kind is prohibited. So then Jesus could say that a man has broken the sixth commandment. He has murdered if he is angry unjustly with his brother in his heart. If he hates his brother, he, is, um, he has committed, he's broken, he's violated uh, the sixth commandment. And we see from this, of course, that the law of God is perfect. It's complete. It forbids even the smallest degree of every kind of sin. And, and the law is spiritual in nature. And that means that, that the law addresses us, not just our outward behavior, but it reaches all the way into our understanding, our will, our affections, and all other powers of the soul, as well as our words, our works, our gestures, our emotions. Now I'm quoting there from the larger catechism, question and answer 99. But this is what we see taught in Scripture. Every command that you hear from God stems from, and it, find, it is an application of one of the Ten Commandments. Every commandment in Scripture can be traced right back to source, the summary of God's moral law in the Ten Commandments. And that's why Paul can rightly say in verse 9, if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And along with the first four commandments, these are the commandments that the Spirit of God writes upon our hearts as he teaches and empowers us to love. Until that law, the law of God is perfectly written upon our hearts, until the day when we are finally rid of the corrupting influence of our indwelling sin, until that day, we will need to be taught what does it look like to love God, to love our neighbor. We will need to learn that from the guide of the Ten Commandments. And it is the love of Christ for us that compels us with hearts inflamed by His love to love Him in return by fulfilling those commandments. Remember what Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. These are his commandments. This is the, how we get to show our love to the Lord Jesus Christ. I once heard the, the dynamic between love and law. I heard it illustrated using uh, a gun as an illustration in which uh, the, the love of God is the powder. The, the firing pin that ignites the powder is the Holy Spirit. And we are the bullet that, that propelled by that love of God. And the law is the target. That's what we're aiming for, is to love our neighbor, to love God in, conform, in fulfillment, Paul says here, of the law. And I hope you can see that the law of the Ten Commandments then is indispensable to the Christian life 
And the reason for that is because the, the call for us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and to follow Jesus Christ is a call to love God and to, and to love our neighbor in fulfillment of the law. And that's why we're, we're going to spend a significant amount of time in Exodus chapter 20 studying the Ten Commandments so that we can learn what it looks like to be freed by God to love Him and to love other people. And as we look into that law, we will see that it will draw for us a portrait of the perfect man. It will draw for us the portrait of our Lord Jesus Christ who has fulfilled that law as the requirement for us by which we can draw near to God and be acceptable to Him as our Father. But one of the other benefits Jesus Christ came and that He died to provide to us is sanctification by His Spirit. That is where He, as I talked about it last week, He, he renovates our hearts and He conforms us to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. And Paul describes it this way in Romans chapter 8, verses 4 and 5. He said, says there, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Paul would go on in a a few verses later to call the Christians to put to death the misdeeds of the body by the Spirit. The Spirit is working in us to to fulfill the, the law of God. And I hope you hear that and think, what a magnificent blessing that I have been given by God. I couldn't fulfill the law on my own, so now, by the Spirit of Christ, He's going to fulfill it in me. I don't know how to love people from the heart. I don't know how to love God from the heart. And not only has Jesus lived and died to rescue me from the penalty of that sin, but Jesus is now going to teach my heart how to love by dwelling in me and teaching me to sing with David. O of thy law, O Lord. That is a work of God's Spirit in the life of the Christian. And he's going to work it in us and do it in us. And as we study the Ten Commandments, we're going to study it through the lens of love. It's all about love. Now who here wants to learn how to be a better friend and lover? Who wants to be one who is seen by the world and known that you must be a disciple of Jesus Christ? How do, you, how do you, you know that? I know it by your love. The love that you have for the brethren. The love that you have for your neighbor. This is not from this world. And they're right. It's from the Spirit of God. And may He write that law more perfectly upon our hearts in the days and weeks ahead. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us on the bread of heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for for him, O Lord, that we can be called in him, your beloved. And Father, that we are your people, that you have lavished your love upon And Father, may we also consider it a great privilege, the highest calling, in fact, of our lives to be those who are taught by Christ and His Spirit to lavish love upon others. And Father, we confess our weakness and our failing. And uh, Lord, we would not endeavor to do this if, if it was left up to us. May we, in the days ahead, look to Christ and to Him alone uh, to give to us what we need. And may we find ourselves obedient to your call uh, to love God and to love neighbor. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and sing number 493, Savior, Teach Me Day by Day. We haven't sung this in a
quite a while, so the tune it might take a minute for it to come back to us. But uh, or maybe you've never sung it before, and it'll, it'll take you a stanza or two to get it. But I think we'll be able to do it with some help back there from our musicians. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 